Now we can start. <laughs> so good morning to all. I mean, it's a pleasure to share the first panel that will be about payments, credit, and asset, asset prices. It's a paper by Monica Piazzesi and Martin Schneider. So Monica is a John Kenny Professor of Economics at Stanford. She's a program director of the NBER Asset Pricing Program, a fellow of the Academy of Arts and Sciences and Economic Society, and a Guggenheim Fellow during 15 and 16. Uh, then we'll be followed by the discussant, pierre Colin Dufresne. But first, maybe we can start already with your presentation. You will have half an hour. As Luke said, my job is mainly to keep the time, so you have half an hour for the presentation, and then discussant will have 15 minutes. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this conference. Um, this is joint work with Martin Schneider. The motivation uh, for our paper comes from pictures of payments uh, just this, like this one. Uh, this shows payments with inside money uh, in US dollars on the left panel. Non-financial payments are blue uh, and red and brown are payments for securities. And so what you see is that non-financial payments, while they're large, they're about five times GDP, uh, they are dwarfed it by payments for securities. These uh, payments with inside money give rise to interbank payments. Banks handle these uh, payments that you see on the left-hand side by transferring reserves uh, to each other. And so the right panel shows you a much smaller amount of reserve payments between banks. Um, the reason why these are smaller is various uh, netting arrangements. Um, these are Fed wire transfers of reserves that are color coded so that they correspond to the payment instructions that you see on the left panel. Uh, we also added Fed funds transfers. And so the message that I would like you to take away from this picture is uh, two things. One is uh, payments occur in layers. Uh, so there is the layer of bank customers in the left panel that are using inside money to pay uh, for goods and assets. And these payments are handled by banks at a bank layer that, uh, where reserves are used as a medium of exchange. And second, even if you take into account netting, uh, payments for securities uh, are important. And so these two features are absent from economic models of uh, money as a medium of exchange. And so this is what this uh, paper is about. Uh, we want to have a simple model of layered payments um, and asset prices uh, that speaks to uh, monetary policy issues. Um, in, the, in this model, at the layer of bank customers, there are households and institutional investors, and they pay for goods and assets with inside money. And think of a broad concept of inside money that includes deposits, uh, money market mutual fund shares that you would use to make payments, and credit lines that one arranges with a bank, like credit cards, for example. And banks handle the payments instructions that they receive from their customers uh, with outside money. And so in the, here, outside money is reserves. Uh, they help banks to manage their liquidity needs. Banks issue inside money, uh, and that involves leverage costs. And these leverage costs depend on the quantity and the quality of the assets of a bank. Then there's the government. The government issues reserves uh, and other debt. The government also faces leverage costs. Um, the government sets interest on reserves and trades and assets. And so the questions we want to study with this framework is uh, how does monetary policy affect asset prices and goods prices? Uh, and we're also interested in the connection between um, asset markets and the payment system. How do they interact? Having a model with a layered payment system uh, gives us several interesting implications. The first is that uh, the cost of liquidity for outside money, for using outside money, this is for banks, is the spread between the nominal short rate um, and the interest on reserves. This spread um, collapses to zero if reserves are abundant, as has been the case in many, uh, recently in many countries. For inside money, the liquidity cost depends on uh, bank balance sheets. Uh, 
and that liquidity cost always stays positive. It doesn't collapse like the liquidity cost of banks uh, that view bonds and uh, reserves as being perfect substitutes. Uh, inside money always has a positive liquidity cost. The model determines the nominal price level to be higher when banks supply more inside money. And it also says the nominal price level is going to be higher when asset traders demand less inside money. Uh, so if less money is going to asset markets, there will be more money showing up in goods markets, and that pushes up consumer prices. The model features intermediary asset pricing uh, in the sense that assets that are held by banks uh, lower their leverage costs. Uh, and so that means that these assets contain a collateral premium. Also, asset traders use inside money for their asset purchases. Uh, and so these, the liquidity costs of using inside money are priced into the assets that are being traded. In terms of transmission of monetary policy, uh, the government here has several tools that work differently. I can use interest on reserves. That's a tax on bank uh, liquidity. It can uh, change the mix of bank collateral by trading assets. And a general property of the model is that interest rates rules are not enough to characterize, to fully characterize the stance of monetary policy. Uh, the bank balance sheets will also matter. And so determining the collateral bank mix of banks is going to be important. Also, the transmission, monetary, uh, the transmission of monetary policy is going to depend on the financial structure, features such as uh, the extent of netting in financial markets and the share of nominal assets uh, on banks' balance sheets. So let me give you a schematic overview of the model, uh, a model where only goods transactions require uh, inside money. I'm going to add asset trading in a second. So there are uh, various assets. There are risky trees that we uh, think of as paying um, fruits as dividends. There are nominal uh, government liabilities. There's debt and there's reserves that the government issues. And households can invest in these assets either directly um, or indirectly by holding equity or deposits in banks. Only banks hold reserves. You see the blue arrows, these are holdings of assets uh, that provide liquidity benefits. Um, so banks hold reserves that provide to them liquidity benefits and they also borrow and lend reserves to each other in a Fed funds market. So when we add asset trading, um, households can now invest in these assets indirectly through active traders. So they can buy equity in active traders. These are basically asset management companies that issue equity uh, and use inside money provided by banks to trade assets. And then finally, I'm going to be referring to, uh, to inside money as deposits, but the uh, paper takes a broader stance and uh, shows you how, how deposits work just like credit lines. Uh, so instead of using deposits, households and active traders can also arrange uh, for credit lines with banks uh, and they work uh, the same way. Okay, so let me give you a summary of the model. So there are households, they're infinitely lived, they have linear utility, uh, and they're averse to Nigerian uncertainty. This is a uh, tractable way of introducing sensitivity to uncertainty of asset payoffs. These households uh, pay for goods with inside money. Um, then there are financial institutions, there are banks and, and active traders that maximize shareholder value. Uh, they freely adjust equity uh, and they operate constant returns to scale technologies. They receive uh, idiosyncratic liquidity shocks that require payments uh, in banks pay for these liquidity shocks with reserves. They can possibly borrow from other banks these reserves, uh, and there are active traders uh, that pay with inside money. These bank leverage costs are resources uh, when commitments are made. So there's a resource commitment, and that's motivated by agency problems or bankruptcy costs. And these leverage costs increase uh, with the amount of inside money that banks provide, uh, and the amount of borrowing in the Fed funds market that they do. So these are forms of debt that increase their leverage costs. 
leverage cost and decline with uh, how much and the value uh, and the safety of the assets that banks have. The government sets an interest on reserves and sets its path uh, for uh, debts and reserves. And so what we study is competitive equilibria with flexible prices uh, and a constant output. So you see we keep the real side of the economy deliberately simple so that we can focus on the financial side. Uh, and so we view the model that you're going to see as a module that you can combine with many other models. So what gets determined here endogenously is inside money, uh, the nominal price level, and real asset prices. So at the height of the model is bank optimization. And so banks maximize shareholder value by picking all the positions on their balance sheets. Uh, and so banks pick reserves. Doesn't work. Uh, banks pick reserves. Uh, they issue deposits. They lend and borrow in the federal funds market. They buy government debt and other trees. And they choose all these positions uh, to equate the marginal cost of issuing equity with the marginal benefit uh, of holding assets and the marginal cost of issuing debt. The structure of the... Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yes, it, it does, but it's almost invisible. Uh, the, um, thank you. The, the structure of the problem is that we determine two key ratios for banks, and they're going to be the same for all banks in this model, uh, is the liquidity ratio, lambda, which is reserves over deposits, which is inversely related to the money multiplier. And the other ratio is the collateral ratio, kappa, uh, which is risk-weighted assets over debt. So that's one over leverage, basically. These two ratios, if you look at the balance sheet, uh, they're related through the balance sheet. Uh, for example, if you're a narrow bank and you back <coughs> deposits only with reserves, your uh, liquidity ratio is equal to your uh, collateral ratio. But more generally, uh, these two ratios summarize uh, the stance of the, of the banking system. Lambda and kappa, the liquidity ratio and the, and the collateral ratio. So how do banks manage their liquidity? How do they pick their liquidity ratio? Uh, banks enter the period with an amount of reserves M and some deposits D, and then they're hit by liquidity shocks. Uh, these are shocks, lambda tilde, that uh, determine how many funds they have to send to other banks. Or they can receive funds. If this lambda tilde shock is negative, they're receiving funds. Uh, the shocks or ID across banks with a mean zero, and this distribution has an upper bound of lambda upper bar. Banks have a liquidity constraint, which says that they have to send these funds with uh, reserves, M, plus any Fed funds borrowing that they do in, of reserves if they run out of reserves. So banks choose their liquidity ratio lambda, uh, the amount of reserves over deposits, and they only borrow if this uh, liquidity ratio that they chose turns out to be too low exposed. Uh, so if they receive a liquidity shock that they cannot handle with their own reserves, they borrow from other banks. Ex ante, this means that uh, banks know that by choosing uh, a high liquidity ratio, they get liquidity benefits, especially if this liquidity uh, ratio is smaller than the upper bound, because then that means there's still a positive probability that they may run out of reserves. How does uh, capital structure choice work here? So what, what is breaking Modigliani-Miller uh, in this model are these leverage costs per dollar of uh, debt that banks issue. These costs, we model them as a smooth function C of the collateral ratio kappa. So kappa, again, is the risk-weighted assets over debt. Uh, and leverage you face these banks face leverage costs that, that are decreasing and convex. And this idea, uh, the idea here is that um, if a bank has a higher value and safety of assets, that lowers their leverage costs. Uh, and more and more debt is increasingly costly. So shareholder maximization in this model uh, gives rise to many first order conditions. Uh, let me il illustrate how uh, first order conditions work for assets uh, that provide collateral benefits to banks, uh, because that illustrates that how these collateral benefits are valued uh, in these assets. <coughs> 
So what banks have to do is they have to provide a certain uh, real return on equity that households demand, their shareholders. Uh, share households are risk neutral, so they have a discount rate delta. Um, so banks know that they have to deliver delta. And uh, when they're holding short bonds, they're equating uh, the real return on equity with the nominal interest on these short bonds, I, um, net of inflation. But now, short bond, these short bonds uh, provide them with collateral benefits. Uh, and so it's not just the pecuniary return that they're receiving on these bonds, but also the collateral benefit. And the collateral benefit is derived from this leverage cost function C, which we assumed is decreasing. And that means that the marginal benefit of extra collateral is positive. We also assumed that the function is convex uh, so that the, the marginal benefit of extra collateral is diminishing. So you add more and more collateral, uh, the marginal benefit of adding additional collateral declines. So what do banks do when they face lower interest rates? They look at their first order condition and they know they have to deliver a real return on equity. Uh, if interest rates on these bonds are lower, they know that they uh, need to increase their marginal benefit of extra uh, collateral, and that means they lower their, they choose a lower collateral ratio. Uh, in other words, if banks are faced with lower interest rates, what they do is they increase leverage to, to maintain their return on equity. This is a form of intermediary asset pricing because uh, here in this model, the standard Euler equation for short bonds doesn't hold. Uh, so households are not pricing short nominal bonds. Uh, it's banks that value short bonds for their collateral benefits. Households don't derive collateral benefits. Uh, and so uh, they don't price these bonds. And so you get endogenous market segmentation where by banks hold these, uh, banks hold the bonds uh, and, and not the households. Did we, I think we went too fast. Okay, yeah. Um, how about uh, assets that provide liquidity benefits? So we just went through um, the first order condition of a short bond, which only provides you with um, collateral benefits. Reserves provide collateral benefits, so they also have a marginal benefit of collateral priced in. Uh, but their first order condition also contains a liquidity benefit, a marginal liquidity benefit, and that's basically the probability that a bank runs out of reserves, uh, the probability that they receive a liquidity shock lambda uh, tilde that is larger than their liquidity ratio, times the marginal cost of leverage. So they have to borrow from other banks uh, when they run out of reserves, and so they face a marginal cost of, of leverage. And so by comparing uh, the first order condition for short bonds with a sh uh, first order condition of reserves um, and looking at the difference, you see that uh, the spread between uh, the short rate and the interest on reserve measures the marginal liquidity benefit. That's basically the expected marginal cost of overnight borrowing for banks. An additional collateral lowers uh, these marginal cost of borrowing uh, and so an increase in, in kappa of the collateral ratio lowers these costs. Since there's an upper bound on the liquidity uh, shock distribution, uh, we can think of two regions. One region in which banks choose low liquidity ratios that are lower than the upper bound. In this case, there's still a positive probability of running out of reserves. This, that's this expression, that probability is positive. And in that case, banks get a positive liquidity benefit from holding reserves. If they're holding a liquidity, if they have a liquidity ratio that is above this threshold, um, this upper uh, bound, that implies that the two assets become perfect substitutes. Bonds, short bonds, and reserves become perfect substitutes. The interest on these uh, short bonds collapses to the interest on reserves. Um, and so this is uh, what happens in, in this region. I can show you this graphically. Uh, we're gonna plot the two key ratios that we want to de determine in equilibrium uh, on the axis, on the, on the horizontal axis is the, is the liquidity ratio, on the vertical axis is the collateral ratio, and there are now two regions um, that are separated by the upper bound of the liquidity shock distribution. For low liquidity ratios, uh, reserves are sca scarce. Um, in that case, banks borrow from other banks uh, when they run out of reserves. 
for very high liquidity ratios beyond some upper, the, the upper bound of liquidity shocks, reserves are abundant. In that case, uh, banks never borrow reserves from other banks. So we want to determine the equilibrium uh, in our model, and we are going to do that with two curves. Uh, the first curve is the liquidity management curve. It describes how banks manage liquidity. It, this curve answers the question, how much collateral is optimal at some liquidity ratio uh, lambda? And the liquidity management curve is derived from the first order condition of reserves that I already showed you. And so if you look at, the, uh, at this last term here, this liquidity benefit, uh, you can see that the liquidity management curve is going to slope down. Uh, why? Because when banks have a high liquidity ratio, uh, they have to borrow overnight less often from other banks. Uh, and that means that it is okay to have high borrowing costs. Uh, so it's fine for them to have a low collateral ratio. And so that's why this curve slopes down. And if they have uh, abundant reserves, if the liquidity ratio is very high, uh, there's no further reduction in this collateral ratio. Equivalently, if you don't want to think about uh, the first order condition of reserves, you can equivalently think of uh, this function as a money demand curve for banks. A high collateral ratio corresponds to high interest rates, uh, and high interest rates mean that there's a high cost of liquidity for banks. Uh, and so when that happens, when interest rates are high, they choose a low liquidity ratio. If they have uh, high enough reserves, banks are in a liquidity trap, their money demand is no longer sensitive to interest rates. The second curve, of, we need an equilibrium, we need two curves to intersect, uh, and so the second curve is uh, the capital structure curve. We've already seen that the balance sheet of banks connects liquidity ratios, uh, the liquidity ratio and the collateral ratio, and so the capital structure curve answers the question, given the other collateral available to banks, what liquidity ratio is needed uh, to achieve a certain collateral ratio? This curve slopes up uh, just mechanically because to get more collateral, banks have to add reserves. The equilibrium is the intersection of these two curves. Uh, the equilibrium can be either in the region where reserves are scarce or in the region where reserves are abundant. And these curves will shift around with policy uh, and asset market shocks. But before I show you examples of shifting these curves, let me uh, talk more about how the model determines the other variables in the model once you know what bank's liquidity ratio and, and collateral ratio is. If these two ratios are higher, that means that it's cheaper for banks to provide deposits, uh, and so deposits are cheaper, um, and it means that active traders will hold more uh, of these deposits. They have a higher demand of, for inside money uh, when deposits are cheaper. This, these, this cheapness of, of using inside money gets priced into the trees that are being traded. Uh, so they will go up, uh, these prices. The nominal price level will then be determined by a quantity equation. So the nominal output, uh, remember output is fixed in, the, in, in this model. Nominal output equals the amount of reserves, M, times the money multiplier. Uh, and so that's the, the amount of inside money deposits times velocity in the model. And, and here, velocity is one minus uh, the share of deposits that active traders hold in asset markets. So it's the amount of money that goes into the good market. It's one, one minus the deposit share of asset traders. And so only money circulating in the good market is going to matter for determining the price level. And velocity uh, is low if deposits are cheap. Um, because more, if deposits are cheap, again, uh, asset traders will demand more deposits for asset trading. Their, their demand is interest rate sensitive, so they will uh, demand more inside money, and so more money will go to asset markets, uh, and that is going to uh, lower the price level. Here in this model, velocity is also low if asset markets boom, uh, because if uh, as tree prices are high, if, for example, uh, active traders perceive lower uncertainty about tree payoffs, they're valuing the, the trees more, and so they need more inside money to buy and sell these trees. Uh, and so the more inside, the, if you see an asset price boom, that is going to suck money, inside money, out of the goods market and brings it to the asset market. <clears throat> 
and that's going to lower the price level. That's going to be deflationary. So let me talk about uh, two types of policy uh, that the central bank can do to tighten money. So here it's all about how can central banks tighten money. They can either do an asset sale, uh, they can sell bonds uh, to banks in exchange for reserves, so they're withdrawing reserves uh, and give bonds to banks. Um, that means that more collateral other than reserves is available to banks, these bonds. That means that a lower uh, liquidity ratio is needed to achieve any collateral ratio kappa because there's all these other collateral around. Banks can reduce their reserve holdings. And so that means that the capital structure curve shifts left. So now we have, we're, we're walking along, uh, along the money demand curve for banks um, to the new equilibrium. Uh, and you see that the, the banks are going to pick lower reserve holdings, the li liquidity ratio is going down, uh, and lower reserve holdings uh, along the money demand curve means higher interest rates. Higher interest rates correspond to higher collateral ratios. This policy is deflationary because there's fewer reserves in, within the banking system, uh, and so there are, uh, there's overall less inside money provided uh, that through the quantity equation is, is deflationary. This policy has a stronger effect if the sale, uh, this asset sale is large enough to bring you all the way from uh, abundant reserves to the scarce reserve regime, as I, I'm showing you this in this graph. Um, I'm pushing the capital structure curve all the way to scarce reserves. Uh, and so that's a strong effect because now we're changing interest rates because the collateral ratio changes. It also has a stronger effect if there's less interbank netting because now the, the lower uh, reserves in the bank system really have a maximum effect on interest rates uh, if there's less netting, if, if banks really need these reserves. An alternative is uh, to increase the interest on reserves. So what does it mean for the central bank to increase uh, interest on reserves? Well, that's a higher return on assets for banks. Uh, to maintain a given return on equity, they can now lower their leverage. Um, and so banks will choose a higher collateral ratio at any given liquidity ratio, and that means the, their money demand shifts up. Uh, here I drew this picture so that uh, higher interest on reserves uh, leads you to the same interest rate as the asset sale that I was considering in the previous slide. So the, uh, you see that the dots end up on the same collateral ratio. And so what, ha what happens with higher interest on reserves is we get a higher collateral ratio. Um, also banks uh, and a higher interest rates. Uh, that means banks will hold more, a higher liquidity ratio, and that is going to be deflationary because a higher liquidity ratio means a lower money multiplier. Um, also, um, because the because these two ratios went up, it's now cheaper for asset traders to hold inside money, and so they will demand more money, and that's gonna be additionally uh, deflationary because now more money is going to asset markets. This effect is stronger if there's more active traders who can absorb uh, the money into asset markets, and if uh, banks have less nominal collateral because uh, defla this deflationary policy is valuing um, creates a higher value of nominal assets, and that will counter uh, affect this uh, increase in interest rates. So let me summarize the type of result that you get from a model with layered payments. Uh, one key result is that policy transmission now depends on the financial structure. Uh, if you change interest on reserves, uh, that changes the profitability of bank assets uh, and the optimal leverage decision of banks and so then, uh, the, to which extent this policy is going to generate inflation, that depends on exactly how exposed bank assets are to inflation. The government can also trade assets. It can change the uh, collateral amount that are available to banks um, to back inside money. And here the effect is going to depend on how much interbank netting there is, to which extent asset trading 
uh, changes reserves, and that really matters for banks uh, if there's very little netting. One key result is that thinking just about uh, setting a short nominal interest rate, that's not enough to think about monetary policy in this world, uh, because you also have to think about bank balance sheets. The payment system and the security and security markets interact in this model because asset market shocks um, affect the nominal price level. Uh, first, because, because when, when asset values are less valuable, when, when asset values decline uh, on bank balance sheets, that lowers the money multiplier, and that's deflationary. That's a, the uh, Friedman and Schwartz uh, effect. That's a traditional effect. The new effect here is that lower, uh, it also affects uh, money demand from asset markets um, because if, if you have lower asset values, asset traders demand less inside money and that is uh, inflationary because more money will show up in goods markets. Monetary policy affects real asset prices uh, both through a supply effect and a demand effect. Uh, asset purchases make bank assets more scarce, that increases their, their real value. Uh, and also asset purchases increase the cost of liquidity uh, for asset traders and that lowers asset values. Thank you. Thanks very much. I was going to provide some easing, but I think the, the policy transmission was, was optimal. So uh, now Pierre-Claude Dufresne, who is a professor at Swiss Finance Institute of the Ecole Polytechnique Federal Lausanne. So you now have uh, 15 minutes for your... Uh, sorry. Yeah, you look, I think your IT skills are needed. <laughs> Never saw such a difficult laptop. Is it a research laptop? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Pierre, you have now 15 minutes. Okay, thanks a lot. Collect questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So this was a fun paper to, to read. Uh, I thank the organizers for you know asking me to discuss a paper way outside my comfort zone. So it's not I don't do, usually do monetary uh, economics. Um, so you know many things have changed with this great recession and uh, monetary policy, as you know, you know zero nominal interest rates and uh, in Switzerland even negative rates. A lot of central bank asset purchases. Uh, you know a very large amount in reserves held by banks even increases in interest rates on reserves uh, and persistent low inflation. So we have few models to think about uh, a lot of these implications. And what these uh, guys do is develop a new equilibrium model of monetary, uh, uh, for monetary economy with two payment layers. One is the consumption good layer where agents trade using deposits inside money. And then there's this interbank settlement of all the transactions using cash reserves outside money. And uh, in the model, monetary policy has two distinct layers. One, which is in, you know, changing the interest on reserves. And two is how much the government chooses to, uh, to borrow. And so uh, the, these, two, uh, these two mixes of monetary policy in the model will affect banks' decisions to hold bond and risky assets and to issue, de issue deposits. And the way uh, the uh, banks' decisions will be affected by the monetary policy decisions comes through uh, essentially two things, two types of constraints. One is bank balance sheet leverage constraints, and the other one is uh, deposit withdrawal liquidity shock uh, that the banks have to insure against. So essentially it's the two, these two, these two uh, mechanisms. And the model has the potential to explain how monetary policy choices with respect to outside money and with respect to the mix between uh, government borrowing and reserves can affect the deposit creation. So really it could, it could potentially explain how monetary policy, these two, ch changing these two le levers will affect inflation, and then also how monetary policy interacts with asset prices. This is a, this is a really complicated model with many, many equations, and you saw only a few of them, so I'm going to show you a few more, just so it really looks like a research conference. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the, the setup. So you have a bunch of risk-neutral consumers, and they have a, they have a you know, discount rate delta, and they face a cash in advance constraint. So whatever they consume, consumption times price, has to be less than deposits. And they receive an exogenous endowment, and they own the banks. So they receive dividends from the banks. Uh, because everybody's risk neutral, and you know, uh, the consumers essentially only get uh, uh, liquidity benefits from deposits, 
in equilibrium, they'll only hold deposits, they'll hold nothing else. And essentially the rate on deposits, the real rate, the nominal rate minus inflation, will essentially be their time preference parameter. That would be it if there was no, no cash and advance constraint, but because there's a cash and advance constraint, they'll accept sometimes a lower, and in fact in equilibrium in steady state, this is gonna be a constant, so they'll accept a, a, a real rate on deposits lower than the, the time preference parameter by essentially the value of the, the constraint, the cash and advance constraint. The other assets in the economy, reserves, uh, borrowing and risky trees are all held by banks. Banks are maximizing the NPV of their, uh, their, their value for, uh, for, for, uh, investor, for, for consumers since consumers hold the banks. And so what banks will do is essentially is finance by easy, either issuing deposits or by uh, interbank borrowing and equity, their purchases of, of, their, their purchases of, uh, of trees, uh, of lending to other banks, and of holding reserves. And when they do so, they incur two types of uh, costs. First, they incur real leverage costs. So if they uh, you know, issue more deposits or if they fund themselves by borrowing from other banks, that's the amount that they're, they borrow, the liability side, they'll incur C of kappa, where kappa is essentially the collateral ratio. Kappa is this risk-weighted asset, reserves plus trees. Notice that the trees are multiplied by a rho here. Rho is kind of an exogenous factor by which you want to uh, weight your risky trees when you compute your risk-weighted assets. So it could, could be also thought as another policy actually tool in this model. And then plus, uh, plus bank, uh, plus, uh, plus lending. So this is essentially uh, all their risk-weighted assets. And then this is the liability side deposits plus, uh, plus uh, short-term borrowing from other banks. So they face this, uh, this risk, you know, this real leverage costs. And they have a cash and advance constraint. They need to finance these leverage costs with, with actually deposits they place at other banks. That's the uh, leverage cost side. And then there's their, banks are also hit, hit by random deposit redemption shocks, these lambda tilde. So there's a whole continuum of banks. Every bank will be hit by some lambda tilde. Lambda tilde could be large, it could be small. There's an upper bound, which is lambda bar. Banks come into the period with some amount of, of reserves, and so they have an initial liquidity ratio, M divided by D. If that ratio is insufficient, so if lambda is less than one, if, if, sorry, if, this, if this ratio is insufficient so that they can't face their, you know, their uh, uh, liquidity shocks, then they have to fund themselves in the interbank market. So you can see the decisions of banks is one on the asset side, choosing the mix of risky assets to hold. And then on the liquidity side, choosing this liquidity ratio, which is related to the inverse of the money multiplier, to uh, essentially cover the, uh, hedge themselves against those random liquidity shocks. So we're gonna have two essentially decision variables for the banks. They have to pick kappa, collateral ratio, they have to pick lambda, lambda to essentially insure against liquidity shocks, kappa to insure to try to minimize those, those uh, real leverage costs. There's also a government. The government borrows overnight in the interbank market and so it can fix, it can choose B of J here, and it can also choose the interest on reserves. And it turns out the government also faces, it's very important in this model, a real leverage cost. The government faces a real leverage cost depending on, uh, essentially you can see it's, it's also this risk-weighted average collateral of the government, but viewed as essentially related to the endowment of, of agents. I guess this is sort of a present value of taxes. And then divided by how much the government, the, the liability side of the government, which is reserves plus government go borrowing, okay? And then they study a steady state equilibrium where essentially output is fixed and where the government holds the reserves on a constant growth path and where the government's essentially borrowing to reserves is constant, okay? Now we have market clearing, market clearing in the goods market, well that's imposed by the cash and advance constraint. Overnight borrowing, uh, 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 market clearing, which is essentially how much do banks need to borrow? Well, it's gonna depend on the distribution of the liquidity shocks, and they only need to borrow if the liquidity shocks are higher than what they came into the period with the liquidity, as a liquidity ratio. So we integrate essentially uh, for every bank, if the, the fraction of banks that have liquidity shocks larger than the decision they made to hold, uh, uh, to hold reserves in the first place. And then there's market clearing and interbank borrowing. Banks borrow and government borrows has to be equal to how much is lent. Now, if we look at this and we look at a steady state equilibrium, we immediately see that if lambda, this liquidity ratio has to be constant in steady state, then both reserves and deposits have to grow at the same rate. That means everything grows at the same rate. That means from this equation, we immediately that inflation is fixed 
at the exogenous growth rate. So inflation is going to be fixed at a, at a constant growth rate in steady state. We have a bunch of first order condition that Monica already discussed. It's always of the same order, which is first order condition for bank borrowing. The, the real rate that banks are willing to take on borrowing has to be equal to the time preference parameter. That would be it if there were no constraints, but there's collateral constraints, so we're, we're sometimes willing to take, or in fact, in equilibrium, always willing to take a lower rate than the discount factor uh, if the collateral brings benefits. Same thing for the trees. The trees have exactly the same equation as bonds. They're essentially isomorphic, except for this row. Remember, the risk-weighted assets have this exogenous row, so if rho is really, really small, then you know the benefit that, the, that holding trees will give you from a collateral perspective is lower than bonds. So essentially, this mechanical uh, or you could think of this as a policy lever to essentially manipulate the relative return on risky assets and on, on bonds. And then you have this difference between bond nominal rates and rates on reserves, which here is uh, the interest, one of the very interesting part of this model, which is related to essentially, has essentially the same flavor as bonds because reserves also help you with your collateral constraint, but then on the other hand, reserves also bring liquidity benefits, so that's why you have this difference in the marginal cost minus marginal benefits of bonds versus reserves, and multiplied by this factor here, which essentially depends on the probability of needing to actually borrow, right? So when lambda is sufficiently large, that G of lambda, which is the probability of having liquidity shocks larger, uh, smaller than lambda, so essentially the one minus G is the probability of having liquidity shocks larger than lambda and needing to borrow, then, then, then you have a, a wedge between uh, the rate of reserves and the rates on bonds. Of course, nobody ever needs to borrow because reserves are sufficiently plentiful. Then you can see that these two are equal. Now, how do we extract the two equilibrium uh, curves from here? Well, one is you combine uh, this equation here with this equation there. So you plug in IB in here, and you can see you ha that you have only exogenous coefficients here uh, on this left-hand side, and essentially an equation that depends only on lambda and kappa. This is the liquidity management curve, the first equation. And the second equation just takes the actual definition of collateral. Remember, collateral is risk-weighted assets divided by liability. Divide the numerator and the denominator by D, and you get, an, you get an expression that's also only a function of kappa and lambda. So you get two equations, two unknowns, and that's how you solve for the equilibrium. Now, what's interesting is you immediately see from these equations that you know, the liquidity management curve does not depend on B, only depends on IR, one of the policy tools. And the capital structure curve, on the other hand, is the opposite. It only depends on B. Remember, B is the ratio of government borrowing to uh, outstanding uh, deposits. So it's, it's, uh, you can see that this, this is going to be affected by how much the government chooses to borrow. This is going to be affected by the interest rate on reserve that the government chooses to set. And so we study essentially how uh, in equilibrium, the solution to this system of two equations to announce depends on uh, changes in policy variables that's I, R, R, I, R, and, and B. Okay? And so that's the whole... Uh, the whole idea of looking at these graphs and then thinking about changes in parameters and how they would affect the equilibrium, you can immediately see from the graph, right, that you have these essentially two regions. To the right of this region, this is essentially in this equation where g of lambda is equal to 1. When g of lambda is equal to 1, right, you can see that this equation essentially pins down kappa. So for, for the whole region where lambda is greater than lambda bar, the liquidity management curve picks down, picks, pick, uh, pins down kappa equal to a constant. So this is this, this component here. And then, you know, we can, so we have the liquidity trap region, if you so wish, and then the, the sort of more standard uh, region on the left. And we can see now that if we sort of shift, for example, the interest rate on reserves, if we shift the interest rate, sorry, if we shift the interest rate on reserves, only this equation is affected, it shifts up, this one doesn't change. So shifting, for example, the interest rate on reserves up means that the blue curve uh, is shifting up and the green curve is unchanged. You can see that this will always change both the collateral ratio and lambda, and you can uh, work out how this affects the equilibrium uh, outcomes, and Monica already explained that in great detail. So it's essentially the mechanisms of the model. They extend this in many, many different ways. So it's, it's a very, very rich model. It's hundreds of equations. Uh, you know, you, so you can think about adding nominal collateral assets, credit lines, carry trades, active traders, netting, uncertainty premia, and so on, and see how this affects these two equations. Let me give you my, uh, uh, my comments. So, you know, first, as you can see from the description of the model, this is crucially dependent on these leverage cost functions. I mean, we, we need, I, I would like to hear more about the micro foundation for these functions, and especially the one of the government, because already in this model, if you think about the optimum, it's discussed in the paper, so it's not an insight of mine. They, they know that. Uh, 
it's optimal to set B to zero because bonds and reserves essentially offer the same collateral advantage, but only reserves offer liquidity benefits. So you would have to find a story for why B should be not zero in the model, but, but furthermore, from my perspective, if, if there's almost no cost to issuing large reserves, why not have all, always live in the plentiful reserve regime where we pay no lever real leverage costs? Remember, there's re these are real costs. What about uh, the role between the, the link between bank leverage and aggregate consumption? So in this model, you have this, this since it's an exogenous aggregate output world, you really have that when banks leverage up, real costs increase. So really the consumption of households decreases. So it's, you get this idea that if we should really try to minimize bank leverage. But if we think that bank leverage serves the purpose of financing, say, new products and, and maybe you know, new development, higher productivity, then my, in a production model, you might expect a positive relationship between bank leverage and output. And that might move a little bit in, the, in a different direction. Uh, bank leverage and solvency. There's no bank solvency issue in this model at, at all. Uh, so in the model, abundant reserves lead to interbank lending freeze, right? If you have more reserves, well, you don't have any interbank borrowing anymore. But I would argue that as an explanation of the crisis, maybe this is, you know, putting things upside down. During the, in the crisis, really what, what is the sense we get, at least looking at, exposed at it, is that interbank froze because there was a solvency concern. And then as a response, the government had to come in, or the central bank had to come in and provide more outside liquidity. Right? Whereas in, in the model, the way we stop interbank borrowing is by starting by issuing more uh, reserves. Um, yes, reserves. Uh, and, and then lastly, you know, when you look at this model, you ask why do we need actually banks? Right? In, in the model, uh, banks really only serve as a costly technology to transform outside money reserves into inside money deposits. That's all they. But then maybe let's get rid of that. Let me go to the. Let's go to the Chicago plan. Or you know, we Swiss are always ahead of this. You know, we're trying to vote on this. There's going to be a, actually a. Is actually going to be a referendum on whether or not we want to go there in Switzerland, which is scary, another scary thing to think about. Uh, that's such a referendum. You now we barely understand it as economists, so let's try to explain that to the public. But um, you know, uh, or we could move to electronic digital currency, and then we would, uh, um, you know, get rid of that uh, that issue. So I think I'm almost out of time. In fact, I can't move forward or backward anymore. So that that probably is a sign. Is that what it is? <laughs> Uh, you can't either. See, it's not just me. Okay. Okay, I managed. I managed. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, so I don't think uh, I think I'm pretty much out of. Uh, yeah, the last point I was wanted to make is in steady state, inflation is equal to the exogenous <coughs> growth rate of reserves in this model. So when we really think about the impact of, uh, say, uh, open market operations on inflation, it's really only when thinking about the transition ac across that we get interesting action in this model. And in transitions, as they are uh, smart to. To, to prove they can achieve in one period, but one period is one day. So, you know, that kind of limits the, uh, the, the insight I think we can get from that. Uh, and, and, and I think also this, this one-for-one -one relationship in steady state between the growth rate of, uh, of reserves and inflation doesn't really fit well the, the, the empirics. And, uh, you know, there was this nice, you know, consistent with our, our uh, keynote speech in the, in the morning, right? I, I just took this picture out of the FT which pointed out this incredible cross-section of variation in inflation when you look across different goods. Uh, you probably all read the article, but uh, you know, it, it, it sort of points towards p perhaps the fact that we also need some technological uh, explanation to the persistent low inflation and not just uh, think of inflation in the recent period as a purely uh, monetary phenomenon. Okay, I'm, I have com one big comment for the authors is before, you, before I recommend that you read the paper, I think they have to rewrite and make the equations even easier to read for for the mere mortals, because we spend a lot of time on those. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So now we have 10 minutes, more or less, for questions. So I will collect uh, a few questions.